All right, so just as a quick recap, this was, um, I like to emphasize uh, the things that are very important. And in terms of uh, conceptual, uh, this we're going to follow this train of thinking. So fundamental theorems of calculus. Basically. So fundamental theorem, I want you to think of the last five sections as basically being a roundhouse tour of the rest of the fundamental theorems of calculus. So Calc 1 gave you the fundamental theorem of calculus that we know it. We talked about now the fundamental theorem of line integrals, which was giving that if I then took an integral um, over, let's see, let's see wait, yeah, the close, or I don't know that we close. We can have an open curve. Let's do the general version. So let's have an open curve, C. And then if you have a conservative field, that means it's been the gradient of some potential function, right? Dot dr. And the same way that when you did a regular fundamental theorem of calculus, you took the essentially antiderivative. In other words, you went backwards from di differentiation. So the gradient is differentiating excuse me, potential function. So we evaluate the potential function at the end point, start point, and then that gives you that theorem. Okay, so this is this is the starting point. And really all we're gonna do is take the rest of this up. It's gonna go into double integrals, and this can go into triple integrals. And there's a version of this fundamental theorem in all of this, okay? <laughs> Another thing to highlight that's, that's really important is when we were talking about a conservative vector field, so if I have F being conservative, and M is conservative. And if I start in the same, if I end basically exactly where I started, okay, so here's my initial point, here's my end point, how's it going? Then when I compute what this line integral is going to be, this is going to tell me something. So if I start at A and then I end at B, which is the same thing as A, then is my is my curve closed? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm going to now designate that it's closed with that circle in the middle of the input sign. We're still talking about this curve C. And then I've got my field, which is since F is conservative, I can represent it as this gradient <laughs> dot dr. And then the fundamental theorem of line integral says that regardless of what curve we use, I mean in this case we happen to have it closed, but in general. We just evaluate phi at the end and subtract phi at the at the beginning. So phi at the end minus phi at the beginning. But b or a in the beginning is the same thing as b. Mm -hmm. So I could just put in b. But regardless of what this number is, and regardless of what this number is, they're the same exact number. If I do half the each other. I'm gonna get to zero. So I know I have to rush at the end. And so when I was talking about, if you have a conservative vector field, that when you take a specifically, it has to be closed, right? So if you have a closed curve and you go around, in other words, you're starting and ending in the same spot, that is always going to have to be zero. And that is just simply because of the way that this works. So I wanted you to see that the fundamental theorem is the reason why we're able to make this statement about the conservative fields having the closed integral going to zero, okay? So is that, that domin chain of dominoes where to start, this is the first domino, and then that makes this fall. Mm -hmm. So don't try to go the other way. You can verify backwards, but in terms of why we know this is true, because it comes from this, okay? Is that good? Mm -hmm. Cool. So that's just all I wanted to do to recap the previous section, because there's a lot going on here, and repetition legitimizes. So now let's move into green theorem. Um, Green's theorem is basically going to reiterate um, old concepts and then blend it with something a little bit new. And it's a fun perspective for how these line integrals uh, behave with both circulation and uh, the plot. So here's the theorem. There are going to be two versions of Green's theorem, and you'll see why. So this will be Green's theorem the circulation form. And if we have a circulation form of Green's theorem, what's the other form you think it's going to be? Flux forms. Yeah, but there's going to be a flux form of Green's theorem. So, but let's think about circulation for now. When you think of circulation, you're thinking of how aligned is the field with my curve, right, as it's going through. There's alignment, that's the F dot dr. And so that's what we're going to get in that mindset to let 
C, B, a simple closed piecewise smooth piecewise smooth curve oriented counterclockwise counter clockwise. The only reason why we specify this is just because it makes our definitions work really nice for the right hand rule. Um, that encloses and encloses a connected and not just connected, but also so and simply connected region R in the plane. Okay, so in good old calculus form, we have like these beautiful candy necklaces of vocabulary terms to describe what we want. And basically all that the saying is don't have a weird curve thing that's intersecting on itself or breaking apart. And then make sure it's going in the right direction so the right hand rule works. And then lastly, that inner the, the region that we're trying to enclose, just make it nice. So when you when we were drawing all the examples of connected and simply connected, a connected, simply connected region R on the plane, that's basically just it's nice. If you draw the region, it looks like a region, and that's all there is to say about it. Yeah. Um now what we're gonna do is we're gonna get our deal. So assume, assume that the field would do this in two dimensions, f is equal to f and g. So f and g are the functions, scalar functions, uh, where f and g, f and g have continuous, continuous first partial derivatives, first partial derivatives in R. In other words, over the region that we're talking about. Here's the, the useful part. After all of those conditions are met, we have this really, really useful equation that relates a closed line integral to a double integral over a region. It's a very interesting relationship. So if I take a closed, so again, an integral, if you put that, all that means is that you've specifically said that C is closed. Um, over f dot dr. Remember, f dot dr is the form that doesn't go with flux. f dot dr goes with circulation, how aligned you are. One way uh, that when we talked about this originally, it, we can write this as f dx plus g dy. And the, the way that makes it easy to remember that is because this is the dot product. And if you think of the dr being like the dx component, this is f, there's that dx, g dy. And what we're relating this single line integral, it's a single line and closed line integral, this is actually going to be equivalent to a double integral over the region that you are enclosing by your simple curve of this value. It's going to be gx, the partial derivative of g with respect to x, and you subtract f1. So to reiterate, we've already talked about this. This is what we call the circulation. We've already done the derivation for that. The g of x partial? Yeah, so like g partial x, s partial y. And um, this is also the circulation. So these are equivalent forms for circulation that we talked about. And then here's something inside. This integrand is a very specific idea. This is something we call curl. And I know I hinted at the relationship that circulation goes with Curl and that flux goes with what? Divergence. Dimensions. Okay. So this is a little bit abstract. So once you get this in your notes, give me a thumbs up because then I'm going to draw you one picture that you can use in your notes to help ground yourself. Don't worry, two times. I'm just doing the word right now. Oh, 
I'll keep the equations up because the equations are important. Well, <laughs> okay, well, so imagine we've got some space. Here's the plane, right? Two dimensions here is x, here's y. I want everybody to draw this. And so closed curves, you don't have to draw a closed curve that looks like mine, but that's okay. Just make sure it's a, you have a closed curve C that's oriented counterclockwise. In a way, and notice that intuitively you're going to draw something that's containing a region that is going to be connected and simply connected. That's just naturally. Saying. If you don't intersect yourself, you'll be fine. And so notice that when we're thinking about the way that the field is interacting, originally when we did circulation, I said, okay, so it's like we're looking at the contributions of the unit tangent together with the field, and we're looking at how those add up, and we're going to integrate all the way around our curve. And so that's initially, that, that's basically what we think of as the circulation. So what on earth does that have to say about what's going on? So what I, the relationship between this curve C and the region R, there's a very specific reason why C needs to be closed. If you don't close a region, you have no R. Does that make sense? Because the very thing that's R is this. Like, so if we turn C into like the boundary, say, of a region, that is R. R is the description of what you just enclosed. So you've created essentially a two-dimensional region over which you're integrating in the plane by closing something in a curve. Does that make sense? So that's going to be the relationship between C and R. So there's two components here that I'm going to try to relate to you to make this make sense. Why C being closed allows us to integrate over R. That's the first step. The second step that we need to understand is how on earth the s dot dr contributions, in other words, these contributions, what that actually means with regard to this random equation that I just put. Okay. So curl is going to relate to essentially the sum total of amount of rotation that's happening inside of the field. Okay. So if your field is rotating around with your curve, naturally, you're going to have more circulation. So if you think about, you turn on the fan in the room to increase circulation, that's not straight. What you're doing is you're inducing curl. The air is curling, you're creating more curl in the way of the air in the next in the room. And so C is a closed curve. If it's not closed, guess what you're not gonna have? R. So if you don't have, so are we gonna consider Green's theorem if C is some open curve? No. no, because it's just not even applicable. You haven't even contained the region R, so there's going to be no relationship between a closed curve and a double integral. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so might be wondering why on earth do we relate these things? Well, sometimes this is just horrible because the kind of thing you might have to parameterize might not be pretty with C. You might have to break C up into a bunch of tiny chunks, so then you're solving like five separate integral problems when potentially... Just taking a partial derivative of the components of the field and then subtracting them to get an integrand, that's not bad. And especially if you are you have a specific curve, C, that actually allows itself to be very easily described as a double integral region, might as well just do that instead. So, for example, this actually would be really, really annoying to do with double integral. And here's the reason for that. You got to figure out how to describe R. So if you really want to find equations that describe this region, um, go for it. But this would be a case where, okay, this looks more, makes more sense to do in terms of the circulation form. We have these contributions that go around. And that's because this curve could probably just be given in some sort of a parameterization with C. That's pretty straightforward. So it wouldn't be all too difficult to just take my C with my R of T is equal to blah, blah, blah. And then to get the dr, all I have to do is essentially differentiate this where dr is R prime of T dt. So it's easier to take a derivative sometimes of the more complex parameter is curves than it is to try to turn it into a double integral. However, there are exceptions. For example, you might have a curve that does something annoying like this. And then parameterizing something that goes like this in counterclockwise fashion, that's our C. Well, is that a closed curve C? No. It's not. Well, it's closed, yeah. it goes all the way around. It, closes, it finishes where it ends. Okay, so it's closed. But if we want to find a C that describes that entire curve in a single parameterized equation, good luck. 
right? This is four separate lines that you need to parameterize depending on what the locations of these points are on the curve. That's going to be annoying. So you can solve four integral problems, or you can use Green's theorem. And we know we can use Green's theorem because we're talking about circulation and C is closed, which means that this entire region here is R. Well, it's easier to contain a linear regions in R with a double integral. In other words, in Cartesian, I could say, okay, well, I'm just going to integrate in this direction and then find my intersection point to stop and then just go the other way. So this would be, you can do that in one field swoop and then just make sure you complete the curl of whatever field is being interacted with. Um, but this will help you kind of interpret. So if it's more flowy, more curvy, kind of more like that, this will probably be your best bet. If you're given a C that is just given in a single R, probably going to be the easiest thing to do. But you start getting these weird things like boxes or rectangular regions or like a triangle region or something that you'd have to parameterize with several curves. Sure, this is possible. Is it horrible and disgusting and tedious and you've got to do a bunch of those? Yeah. Or you could just describe the region in R and then uh, switch out the integrand and then you get the same exact result. Okay. So give me a thumbs up if you understand the relationship between C and R. Yes. So C the curve and R of each. Okay. Raise, give me a thumbs up if you could tell me why C has to be closed in order for Green's theorem to be applied. Exactly. There is no region if you don't even close it. Okay. And then that these contributions f dot dr is going to be equivalent to doing something we call the curve. Okay. So circulation together with curl. Those two things go together. All good? Okay. So C is going to be given as a, so it's a, it's a curve. That means it's, a, it's going to be given as a, as a function, correct? Parameterized curve. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes they'll just give you the parameterization straight up. And if they do that, then I just do this. Okay. But sometimes it'll say, hey, I'll describe to you what the curve looks like. But in reality, it might be something ugly that you can't actually just do in one function, like one parameterization. And so in the, in the problem with the, the boxes is that each one of those lines counts as a separate C? Yes. Because then now you have four separate sub Cs. Mm -hmm. So you have to break it into C1, T2, T3, T4, right. all together make the overall C. Good questions. Cool, because this is core. Like if you get this, then technically some of these examples just are, you'll, you'll know them mm -hmm. um, from the, the way that we see that. Okay. Cool. Now, um, just as a side note, because this is really neat, the way that these kinds of things work. So if I have that f equals fg, you want to write this down. Um, not necessarily, I probably won't do an exam question off of it, but it's going to unlock this a lot. Um, and then if we say that this is conservative, then that means there exists basically a potential function where it's going to be bx and by. And so if the is conservative, these are the same thing. So f is equal to what? Um, g, uh, and then um, g is equal to what? C so, what? What? so let's take a look at what these components are, OK? So here's gx. Let's see what dx would be. So gx is what? Yeah, by and then x. And then the other part that we're interested in is fy. Okay, so what's f1? x, right, and then y. Hmm. That's weird because aren't these the same things? Yep. But we're subtracting them from each other. So conservative fields have what kind of curl? Zero. Zero. The curl is always going to be zero if this F field is conservative. Gravitational fields are non-rotational. So that's a physical intuition. So when you're standing on the earth, you're not wobbling with it because it's just that is it's irrotational. And uh, there you go. So this is this built into Green's theorem is the test for whether or not a field is conservative or not. That's really cool. Okay. So if a field is conservative, here's here's the first domino. It hits this domino, which says, okay, well, then that means there's some sort of a potential function. 
We change this domino that says, well, then we relate bx to the dx to be dy. Which then hits these, which you compute these, you realize you do the same thing. Suddenly you throw that into Green's theorem. And now all of a sudden you're getting the same exact result. Because didn't we just say the very first thing in class that the closed integral of f dot dr with the fundamental theorem of line integrals gives zero. Mm -hmm. You get it both ways. Is that good? Mm -hmm. So turn back on your notes to when we did the fundamental theorem of line integrals and showed that the f dot dr is going to set and show give you to zero. I didn't write f, I wrote gradient of t. But if f is conservative, that means the same exact thing. So we had a conservative field, we did a closed line integral for circulation, ends up being zero. Then when you look at Green's theorem and it says, well, actually that's just gonna be the same thing as this interesting double integral construction. And then we get the same result an alternative way. We say, well, if f is conservative again, we still show it's, it's always going to give zero. So if a field is conservative, then the integral over circulation is always going to be what? Zero. There you go. That simple. I say that it's not that simple, but <laughs> <laughs> when you look at the when you look at the definition and, and you piece it together, you can reach those conclusions. So I want you to see the relationships. That's the hardest part about the chapter. It's just so much volume, so you got to give a context for what's what's what describing each other. Okay, thumbs up about that. Okay. So I defined that's two dimensional curl good. Um, point twenty seven. There is no exam question from this section specifically, so I'm kind of just having a lot of fun because it's really pretty. Okay, let's do a problem so they can see it. I'm really glad you asked that question because you just motivated the reason why we have next lecture which is essentially going to give the construction from which you'll go backwards and say, oh, wait a second, that's just a special case of a broader definition of what we mean by curl. Yeah, so we'll get there, but we're thinking in the right direction. <laughs> well, I mean, it's every, it's every single Tuesday, I mean, Also, I would, I'm going to be taking my research on the road to the regional MAA conference on Saturday. So no office hours because I won't be there. Um, I'm gonna try to convince some, some people that I, I have found something worth considering in academia. You believe in me? Absolutely. No, don't believe in me. I believe in God. <laughs> and then he tells me what to do. <laughs> okay, so here's the example. I think that this example is my favorite because it really illuminates um, the relationship between computation in Green's theorem versus knowing about what Green's theorem is describing. Because that's one thing that's challenging. It's hard enough to figure out what on earth is being described, much less than, okay, here's actual field equations. Do it, okay? So here's a field. Let's do a rotational field just so that we get something with actual curl. Um, minus y and x. And then let's get a region. Actually, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this like this. I'm actually gonna start with giving you the curve C. So C R of T as given by cosine of T sine of T, and then I want this to start at zero and end at two pi. Yeah, good. Okay, so like we were talking about the relationship between C and R. You tell me, is C closed? Yeah, because if you put in zero, cosine of zero and sine of zero, it's going to give the same thing as cosine of two pi and sine of two pi. You start and end in the same spot, it's closed. Does this intersect itself? No, 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 it doesn't. Okay, so sounds like we've got something that we can work with with greens here, right? Because, I mean, I would really hope that if I teach you guys tell three for an entire semester, you would know what this parameterizes is for it, right? This is a what? Circle. Yeah, with radius? One. Yes, a unit circle. Okay, so here's our unit circle. One, one, minus one, minus one. And it's being traced out as we require counterclockwise. Here's our C. Okay, now this is closed. So what is R? C. Uh, 
Yeah, the, the region that's inside of C, that's R. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to solve this problem using the line integral and also using the double integral to show that they give the same exact thing, but also to demonstrate that both can actually have their own slick advantages depending on the context of the problem. So let's do the line integral version first. So we won't concern ourselves with the R just yet, but if I want circulation, I'm looking at the integral and it happens to be closed. So I'll put the little circle. So C F dot D R. Okay, we're gonna evaluate this because this is describing the circulation. So you have to this is circulation. Now, what are my ingredients? Well, I have F, okay? Well, F, let's see, I'll do it like this. So F is equal to minus Y and X. That's just given to us, but we don't have to do any work there. Here's where we do need to make a consideration. Do you know what this Y and this X actually represent with respect to C? Finding. Yes, but the components. This is the x. This is the y. So when I say minus y, what's going right here? Minus sine t. Good. Minus sine t. And then when I say x and this component, what's that actually? Like? Oh. Now I've described. I've described my <laughs> my field. Okay. Now. Notice that this is the dot product between two vectors. I have my f vector in terms of the parameter. I need to get dr. I have r already. So I see, it's, okay, I've got r of t is equal to cosine t and sine t. And so dr is going to be r prime of t dt on the outside. So well, basically, just think, take a derivative, and then don't forget to throw on the differential at the end. So, mm -hmm. what's the derivative of cosine? Sine sine two minus sine three, and then sine's going to go to what? Cosine two, cosine. And then because this is the dr, we don't want to forget to have the other. Okay. So we have two ingredients. We have the field given in terms of t. We have dot dr. Dr is given in terms of t. We're now ready uh, to throw this into the integral. In terms of t, and guess what? We have given the limits of integration in the original problem. So I could say, all right, I've got the integral. I don't need to say it's closed anymore because I can just plug in my dot product. So what is the lower limit of integration for t? We'll start at zero and where? Two pi. And at two pi. Now f is the vector minus sine t cosine t. And what am I taking the dot product with? Yeah, the dr. So minus sine t cosine t dt. Ah, interesting. And then let's just not forget how dot products work. So from 0 to 2 pi, I get minus sine times minus sine is sine squared of t. Cosine times cosine is cosine squared t. And then the dt is channeling. But that's just one. So we're taking the integral of one. So this is the integral from zero to two pi of one times dt. And when you have that situation, that's just the distance between zero and two pi. So this is two pi. Isn't that pretty cool? How many radians is it to do a full rotation in, of a circle? Unit circle? Huh. And with the rotational field that is designed to be minus y x, this is literally what the field arrows are looking for. It goes like this and it rotates exactly tangent around the edge. Isn't that pretty? Mm -hmm. This rotational field is exactly tangent with that unit tangent all the way around. That's why we call these rotational fields. It's for the very reason that, well, they rotate in a circle. And so when we have a curve that in itself is perfectly in alignment with the rotation of a rotational field, yeah, it makes sense that we would just count up the number of radians that we need to rotate. Okay, so questions about how we drew C in the point. Any questions about um, 
how we got f to be in terms of t instead of just the original variables. Any questions involving getting what the dr is from the parameterization? Do you have a question about yes. the f? So how did it, so r, r t was given by definition as cosine t sine t, right? Yes, so this would be given to you in the question statement. That if, it was, if it was provided with a particular radius other than one, would that carry over into the f? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Because then that would that would be the new x component. So if it was seven cosine p, that's your new x, and that would go into there. Yep. And so, coincidentally, in this case, um, f happens to have equaled uh, r prime to uh, dt, correct? Is that's it? total coincidence here. So yeah, so that will not always happen. It's just having to work out because negative y x, which happens to be all right. All right. Oh, cool. That's good. Any questions about finding dr? Any questions about the relationship between how to go from the funny looking integral sum to this notation? Questions about oh, where it's going? Yeah. It's gotta be it's gotta be a uh, closed uh, function, closed loop. And then you just put in the uh, limits of integration of that and they equal the same points. Okay. Yep. So you're gonna do pi times from there. And then any questions about taking the dot product or how that actually visually looks when you put those? I forgot all chapter 13. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cool. So then it sounds like we've got the left side of Green's game. Cool. All right, let's do the double integral side. In my opinion, this is the cooler way. The cooler way. The math major way to do it. Which most times when you say the math major way to do it, just substitute the lazier way to do it or the way that requires less work and there's usually good. They say they say that computer scientists build programs to do work for them. That's how a computer scientist is lazy. A mathematician proves theorems so that they can call their results obvious. And so there's a relationship between those things I find quite hard. Okay, um, for the double integral form. Okay, so Green's theorem. I'll re I'll rewrite it because it's new. So Green's theorem, Green's theorem is saying that this line integral that we just did f dot v r is the same as, look back in your notes, and the double integral over r, and then the curl, the two-dimensional curl is dx minus y dA, okay? So now we have the ingredients that we need to find. We have some region r, and that's going to be the circle, but then we have a field, and then now notice that we don't need to deal with any parameterization business. It just goes straight from the field, our information in the integral. And so, if this is our field, f is equal to minus y and x, then this tells me that f is equal to what? Minus y. And that g is equal to what? x. Everybody good with that? So when you have a field, whatever these are, this component is f, this component is g. If we had another dimension, that would be h. Now, we need to compute the curl. So from here, let's take a look at what's going on, right? So gx, if I take g and I differentiate g with respect to the variable x, what do I get? Yep. And then, okay, what's the other thing? What's the other partial derivative I'm interested in? Um, no, no, no. Okay. Good, f1. And f1, and f1, like someone already said, is what? Negative one. one. Okay, so. What I could say is I can compute the circulation f dot dr by Green's theorem using the double integral over this region r of the curl, which is gx minus f of y, or f y, dA. Citing Green's theorem to find the circulation. And then if I simplify this, this is just two times the double integral over a region d a. And if you remember, back in chapter 16, if the integrand is just one, we're claiming, especially for a double integral, we just want the area of whatever r is. Well, we know exactly what shape r is. What shape is r? With radius. So the area of a circle is going to be 
pi times the radius, which is one squared. <laughs> So it wasn't a surprise, surprise, Green theorem works, two pi again. Yeah. Well, just use polar coordinates. <laughs> also, technically, you wouldn't even need to use polar coordinates because the curl was a constant. And if the curl was constant, you're still just finding the area. So you would just need the area of an ellipse. And that formula is a, b over 2, where a and b are the major and minor x. So, uh, okay. So what are we really saying? When we, when we did this, this curl, it's how much rotation is happening inside of the thing. Um, have you guys ever, oh, have you ever been... I know you've all washed the dishes at some point. Yeah. You're lying if you say you haven't done the dishes. And so you got your tub of water. And then you're done and you're finally, and you're ready to drain the sink and everything. And so as, yeah, exactly, you swear. So as it's going into the drain, you're not boring and you don't just let it drain. You like start making a tornado in the water and it starts going around. Yeah. So what happens is you're introducing, you're introducing rotation into your view. In other words, you're, there's curl in something that's swirling around. Now the boundary of the sink is also the water along the boundary of the sink is going to be rotating around as well. In other words, the net amount of swirling around rotation that's happening inside of the middle of the sink with all the water, integrating all of those contributions of rotation in the double integral, is actually just the net result of what the border of rotation is happening along your border. Okay, so what's happening along the border of your sink and the overall rotation on that specific line is going to end up just being the sum total represented by all of the rotations happening within their sink. And so that relationship between those two things um, is what all, all of what Green's theorem is about. Stokes' theorem is going to take this exact idea and say, well, who's to say we got to spin around in the point? Let's introduce rotation now just into some three-dimensional space. So now I've got things circulating in three dimensions. Then the surface that it's containing all of this rotation the rotation along that surface is just the same thing as the summing up all of the rotations inside. Okay, so do you see the hint of the fundamental theorem? This idea of fundamental theorem says, instead of summing up every single piece, just look at the outside, look at the boundaries. Instead of doing all the work on the interior, that'll be the same exact thing as just doing evaluations on the very outside. Okay, so like here, we're doing Instead of doing all of the summations of curl and rotation inside of a region, just look at the outside of the boundary and about it. That's back in Calc 1, when you have a to b, f of x to x is equal to antiderivative of f b minus antiderivative of a, what you're saying is, okay, instead of summing up all the contributions under f, just look at the antiderivative on the outside. Same exact idea. Stokes theorem is going to, so if we're involving a double integral, it'll just say, well, you could use the triple integral boundary to talk about, or a double integral boundary to talk about a triple integral, which is all the stuff inside. It's all the same idea. It's just going to look different in computation. Okay? Is that good? Because I know this gets a little bit confusing. Um, so that you, it does require, you got you got to sit with it on your own a little bit. Do the Pearson problems. Um, yeah, okay. Well, I have time when I do is I'm going to write down the definition for the other version. So we did, a, we focused a lot on circulation because frankly, the circulation one for some reason is harder to visualize. Because when we think of divergence, it's easy to think of stuff passing through things. Um, just because we see that happen a lot in physical applications, whereas curl is a little bit more invisible because it happens more with gases and air and water and things that we can't necessarily see as much. But it's going to have a, the same force. The idea is going to be the same, but computations are also going to be very similar. So if you really understood the example that we computed both ways, you would be fine um, with the definition. Okay. So, even. And 
this is Green's theorem again. What am I going to put after that dash? Yeah, plus the evil twin. Okay, so we got circulate, and now we got flux. And so, do I really want to write out the laundry list of? Okay, so basically, pretend like I'm going to write all the English out for let C be a simple closed piecewise smooth curve oriented counterclockwise that encloses the connected and simply connected region R in the plane. Same conditions for great theorem last time. Yes. Counterclockwise. I'm just dyslexic. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to spend my own handwriting, guys. I'm starting to read your line. Okay. All right. So assume we're going to now have a field. Uh, and I'll, I'll actually write this part out because we need to clarify that we're in two dimensions because that does change things. When we go into three dimensions, that's divergence theorem. So we are copy pasting the first uh, paragraph essentially of the previous theorem all the way up until region R in the plane? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because again, it is still Green's theorem. And so the conditions for the theorem are going to be the same. It's just now we're representing it in another way. In a pure math textbook somewhere out there, um, it's actually all housed under what we call Stokes theorem general. And it's this horribly simple, like a four simple equation that categorizes every single fundamental theorem of calculus in its highest generality you can give it in one equation. And so that comes in when you get to like Kelp oh, six or whatever. But... Oh, six. <laughs> it's a All right. Actually, you know what? Maybe let's let's talk about that all right. All right. Uh, assume that we have a two-dimensional, well, let's, let's stay in three dimensions for now, because we'll extend it on Friday. So F, G, and then where F and G are, or have continuous, have continuous, or first partial derivatives. First partial derivative. In R, let's throw that on here and R. Then, okay, this should look pretty familiar to, to what we've already done. So here is we want a closed curve again because if we don't close a region, there is no region. So we need a closed curve. Do you remember what goes? So if f dot dr or f dot tds is for the flux form, do you guys remember what we have for the wait? Sorry, for the circulation of the other one. Do you remember what we have for flux? F yeah, it's f dot n. Because now we're interested in the normal components, not the tangential components. F dot n ds. And then when you go through that, um, we talked about this derivation uh, when we did the section. So f dy minus g ds. So that's what we've already talked about. And then here's what how we relate it to the double integral. It's going to be double integral over the region R that we've enclosed. And there's going to be something called the curl fx plus gy dA. Did I say curl? Yes. I was incorrect. Not curl, the divergence. Curl is for the other way. Curl goes with circulation and divergence goes with flux. This is divergence given in two dimensions. And this right here is flux. And this is just an alternative representation of flux. This one, you'll probably see more though. And it's understood that n is the outward normal vector. So okay, there's a few things that I want you to observe about this. First thing to observe, fx plus gy um, indicates that there is some evidence there of being dot product. And so when Rebecca asked her about, well, how did we get that specific thing for curl previously, right? So because curl was the gy minus f, or sorry, gx minus fy, that's just uh, the two-dimensional case for something. And this is the two-dimensional case where something we call divergence. we we'll define both divergence and curl as operations and Friday. And it's kind of like the big reveal 
of the Illuminati and everything that's been running the government this entire time. And then, um, so here's what I want you guys to know. This, this is the important part, right? Is over here, we've got team circulation. Circulation, which if you want to think of circulation as being analogous to work, then you can do that as well because you're engineers. This is going to be related to sums, uh, essentially, of, do you, do you remember what it's called? Not divergence, but or curl. Curl. circulation has to do with curl. Okay. And then uh, the flux has to do with what? This has to do with rotation, and that should, I mean, make intuitive sense. We call it curl for a reason. Rotation. Rotation of a field. Uh, field. And then divergence isn't going to be rotation. It's going to be this idea of uh, source. So uh, when you, if you were to like put an isolated positron or an electron into a an area like an electric electric potential field or something like that, it's just going to have a radial field that emanates out of it. Um, in other words, those lines that are coming out, it's a source. It's a source of field lines that come out, and that's a divergence. It's not rotating. If I put a charge in, it's not creating field lines that are rotational. Divergence is the opposite. It's yeah. So, um, how do you spell that? I like that word. So, E, I don't want to write imminent. So, imminent. <laughs> um, N and it. So, it'd be E, M, N, E, um, M, and then as if there's sources or not. Okay. Because what's going to happen, and uh, mm -hmm. oh, it's your business. Yeah. I don't see it in there, right? It's like, and it's, and it's because it's based on the image. Uh, okay. 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 E first, and then E M I. Minus. E M I. Oh, okay. And there we go. I love that that's recorded. So we're all okay. So here's the thing. I want to draw a connection because you know you have this connection somewhere in you, and I got to convince you that you have it in your brain. Okay. When we were talking, we were comparing the circulation with the flux, right? Okay. So circulation this idea, and go back to your notes if you have the pictures where the, the circulation things was all the level of alignment, right? So the unit tangent, we want to be aligned with the field. And then what happens is then we said, okay, and then the evil twin is instead of trying to be aligned with the curve, we sum up being normal. And the idea between uh, tangents and their normals is kind of like this, this, these, they oppose each other. So if you're completely parallel, you have zero level of orthogonality. And if you're completely orthogonal, you have zero level of being parallel. If circulation, which relates to Kugel, which relates to the one where your tangent to your curve has to do with rotation, and then does that make sense that it completely opposes the idea of eminent, essentially, that if you're now normal? And so the source, the root issue of circulation coming down from the f dot t and then flux coming from f dot n is going to be the reason why curl and divergence have these opposing basically interactions. And so if something has rotation in it, it's going to have less of this. And if it has less divergence, it's going to have more of this. In the same way that if you're more parallel, it's going to be less orthogonal. If you're more orthogonal, you're going to be less parallel. Does that make sense? There's some sort of space that and that so in the same sense that you could have like a 45 degree angle yeah you could have partial curve you could have with partial boundary <laughs> you know what? i'll just turn that into an exam question because that's basically the idea is that it's the divergence of the curl is going to be zero. Because if you have rotation, and then you want to see how much eminence is happening out of something that's just rotating around, nothing is going to come out of that. And so when we define formally what we mean by this operation of divergence, 
and this divert uh, the, the operation of curl, you can actually literally compute um, using the partial derivatives that that's always going to turn out to be zero. Um, and so, yeah, the relationship between those two is going to be big for next section when we define these operations. Thankfully, it's not going to be too difficult uh, because all we got to do is use the notation that we've been using for gradients all this time, remind ourselves that it's kind of like an operator. And then from then on, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. So, well, I say that. It's straightforward until we have to start parameterizing surfaces. <laughs> Uh, okay, because you know the relationship. So if I we took, uh, let me erase this. One. If I took a region, because basically Green's theorem in two dimensions says it. Okay, I've got a curve. And it's closed in the plane. Yeah. And so what I do is I parameterize the boundary to an inner region <laughs> that we call R. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when we extend this to three dimensions, now we're not just going to have a single curve that is containing a region. To contain something in three dimensions, we need like a full-on surface. So like, let's do like a, yeah, a sphere or something. Okay, so this is like a sphere. So the overall outside surface, we're gonna start calling that S. So S is analogous to C, okay? S is going to be analogous to C and the interior the volume, the stuff that makes up the inside of the solid is then, we call it D. R will be analogous to D. C is gonna be analogous to S, which means there's a whole section in the textbook designated to just teaching us, okay, well, parameterizing within each plane is easy. I wanna then you describe a surface as being something that can be parameterized. So that's where we'll talk about those formulas. Um, so that we can do like basic computations with that. But that's that's the preview of how we finish out the class really as a whole. Um, greens, it's all just extending green. Form. So are there any questions before we go? So R is like the area, right? Yeah, I think all this area is volume. Hmm? Yeah. Sorry. Good. Okay, you guys, I'm very proud of you. We have like a 99% lab completion through lab seven. So thank you. There's one more lab left in the entire class. It's technically due on like what, December 1st, but I'm almost tempted to make it due the day before Thanksgiving break, just to make sure you do it. Um, so let's, let's focus on Pearson uh, for sure, because right now it is not looking good at all. Okay, so rally on Pearson. And then finish out strong. See you guys.